Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 15th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Uh, I could ask everyone to ensure their mobile phones are on silent. You can use them for social media, but don't photograph or film proceedings. Um, the first item on the agenda is an oral evidence session on the draft budget 2017-2018. Could I welcome to the committee uh, Keith Redpath, Chief Officer, Western Bartonshire Health and Social Care Partnership, uh, Vicky Irons, Chief Officer, Angus Health and Social Care Partnership, and Katie Lewis, Chief Finance Officer, Dumfries and Galloway Health and Social Care Partnership. And uh, via a video link, we have uh, Carol Williamson, Chief Officer, Shetland Health and Social Care Partnership. Um, hopefully you can see and hear us uh, okay, Carol? Yes? <laughs> I can, yeah, thanks. Okay, um, thank I'm you. Chief okay. Just say it, just say it. Yeah, I'm Chief Financial Officer rather as Chief Officer. Chief, uh, Chief Finance Officer, sorry. Um, yeah, thanks. So thank you for uh, joining us. Um, um, uh, we will try and ensure that if we are bringing you in, Carol, that we direct questions to you so you know when to come in because this is a not an easy format for you or I uh, or the rest of the committee to work with so we'll try and be as helpful as possible to you and if there are any problems at your ends please wave at us or sh wave your hands frantically or something like that to let us know. Um, okay, <laughs> we move direct to uh, first questions, uh, Alison. Thank you convener, good morning. Um, meeting papers from West and Bartonshire notes that it will only be possible to release resources from acute services to sustain funding for community services if the number of inpatient beds is reduced. Um, and in the inquiry on preventative spend, the committee has heard some evidence that creating a split between acute and community sector creates a false dichotomy, which won't decrease demand on the acute sector and won't necessarily reduce costs because staffing and overhead costs won't be reduced. Um, I'd appreciate if you could expand on that a little and if the panel could give us their views on whether or not you believe that the 2017-18 budget plans indicate the shift in the balance of care. Is such a shift achievable and can demand in the acute sector be reduced to allow resources to shift to community? And there's a, a lot in there. Um, in terms of uh, our report, I think we're fairly clear um, having been at the, uh, the integration process for some time, uh, we are not uncomfortable with the, the system of care, care we have, but uh, the, with the pressures that are on every part of the system, if you're going to have a fundamental shift there, um, there that, that needs to include resource shift uh, as, as well. And um, the reality is, is that in terms of a shift in the balance, that will mean fewer uh, uh, hospital-based beds fewer acute beds, not trying to separate out to say that there's two systems. We are part of a single a, a single system, uh, and all parts of that system need to work, to be working uh, efficiently in order to deliver that. But that will need to see a shift and a, and a, and a, and a reduction in the cost and the, the resource that's consumed within acute and move to community. Uh, I think, um, notwithstanding the, the costs around there and staff, I think we all feel that some of the new services that could be provided in the community could be could be provided by the staff that come out of acute. So that would be, you know, that, that, that would be the resource would follow the, the service and the, and the people. So we wouldn't be de 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 dependent on, uh, you know, new resource from that, we'd be a move, uh, shifting that resource. Uh, from our point of view, I think uh, we see our community assets and resources working very hard as well. So the capacity needs to come from somewhere. And I think with the policy intent, that would the obvious place to that, for that to come from would be from acute. Would anyone else like to comment? Um, I'm happy to come in from an Angus perspective. Um, I think so far we have seen um, some small signs of shifts in resources. Uh, we certainly, as a result of the community services that we've put in place, have seen re less reliance on the use of some of our inpatient facilities in Angus. But also the use of care homes has uh, decreased to commensurate with some of the developments we've seen for providing more care at home. I think the important point to point out, though, in terms of um, our local partnerships, um, uh, which look at the use of the acute sector and the cost of care in the acute sector, um, is that we have to approach that in a kind of roundtable partnership approach to the planning for the future. Um, it's clear for us that 
where the money may not be easy to shift. Um, actually, the change in practice is the thing that we can work on effectively together. So we're seeing more and more of those who provide specialist care in the acute sector now coming out to work with primary care professionals in Angus uh, hand in hand around a multidisciplinary team approach. And that seems to be quite an effective way of changing the balance of care as opposed to shifting the financial resource through the budget settlements. Thank you. I'll come in. Um, within Dumfries and Galloway, we've got quite a, a different model to a number of other partnerships, whereby we have we haven't created that divide in our in our kind of integration scheme. Acute and primary care services are all delegated within that under the um, directorship of one chief officer. Um, and what that's allowed us to do as a partnership is to see around the integration table the diversity of issues, both the pressures within community services and the, the pressures within in acute. One of the things that, that we're keen to do, though, is that there has to be that investment within community services before you can see the, the shift um, coming out of acute. And one of the things that we've done quite effectively within, within Dumfries is um, shift our mental health service provision. So we've actually reduced a number of our beds, increased um, the, the services to the community closer to home, both in kind of dementia care and, and the sort of the overall kind of care of individuals. And we're sort of starting on the pathway of that model within our kind of acute services with some of the investments that we've undertaken to date, particularly um, something that we're trying in the Dumfries and Nisdale area, which is around the one team and, and looking at, at very much that kind of multidisciplinary team and, and getting that much more established within communities. Carol, do you want to come in? Hello. Uh, yeah, we've seen good progress in shifting the balanced care up in Shetland um, through use and intermediate care team, um, but we're finding it more difficult to shift the costs because we've got a small hospital up here with high fixed costs and we're really at the stage there's not a lot of scope for, for closing further sections of the hospital so we're finding it quite difficult to shift the costs. So, so just picking up on what Alison is saying there, it seems to be a bit of a view emerging that there isn't going to be any shift in finance or it's going to be negligible, is that the case? I mean, progress so far shows that there has been a shift. It's a reasonably small shift from... Can, um, you, can, you, can you quantify that? Yeah, so, um, and this is over the period of the last three years, I believe, but I'll double-check that. Um, previously, we were looking at resources around 39%. That has shifted to 41%. Um, so there is a, a small shift, but I think um, it's very clear from all parties concerned um, through the powers that we have, um, through the commissioning plans that we need to see further shifts where, where that applies. Um, and I guess that goes back to my point about um, resources are really invested in people. So if we can change the way that people practice, then the resources will follow that um, through the new care pathways of care that we're developing with acute sector colleagues. Sorry, Alison. Obviously, one group of people that we do need to invest into are the staff, the social care staff. And when integration authorities responded to the committee survey last year, um, the information uh, that we got back suggested that the cost of implementing the living wage for all social care, adult social care workers, exceeded the Scottish government's estimate of 37 million. Um, and the Scottish government, and I'm quoting here, indicated that the 10 million included for sleepovers will be reviewed in year to consider its adequacy with a commitment to discuss and agree how any shortfall would be addressed. Um, what are your views with regards to whether or not the funding provided by the Scottish Government to allow the implementation of the living wage is sufficient? And in particular, is the 10 million allocated for sleepovers, you know, included to cover costs associated with sleepovers, is that sufficient? Uh, thank you. Um, I think very personally in West Dumbartonshire, we, because of the makeup of our of our market, um, we are still a, a direct provider of a quite significant number of services, certainly for older people, less so in terms of other adult services. But the the amount provided for the living wage for us was was certainly sufficient. We did not require everything that we had in the allocation in order to meet that. Um, I think in terms of the sleepovers, we've had a, a, a second tranche of funding again for 17-18. Uh, I think all of us would probably prefer 
uh, to have money invested in providing de direct care rather than people who were uh, sleeping, uh, albeit they, they are available for when people need it. But I think that's given us the impetus to, to review the models of care that we have with various providers to see, make sure we're getting the best use out of that funding. But certainly from the, well, the West Dumbartonshire perspective, we've been, um, I think because of that balance in our provision and as our, our uh, directly employed staff were already paid above the, the minimum wage level, the, the cost implications for us were less uh, less significant than they've been in other parts of Scotland. Okay, thank you. Would you like to comment? Um, yes, absolutely. And I recognise the risk that was um, highlighted from um, the period last year and we had similar concerns raised, but we have not dissimilar to Western Bartonshire, work through all the implications and resolve those within the resources available. Um, one of the, the first partnerships to implement the, the living wage, and we did that through a tender process with a, a sort of a cap of £16.50 an hour for um, that tender process. And what we've uh, sort of worked through from that is that the benchmarking means that that we're sure that um, most of our big providers are now able to pay that living wage to staff. And we've seen some quite significant um, improvements in our ability to recruit and retain um, care staff. So whilst we did have to invest a significant amount of our, our social care fund um, that came through in 15-16 in into this as a specific issue because of the, the issues around rurality and travel time, particularly within a, a locality like Dumfries and Galloway, we thought that was a, a worthwhile well, investment of our resource. In terms of the specific issue around um, sleepovers, um, we've invested around about 400,000 um, into increasing the rates, moving to a, an hourly rate rather than um, a sort of a fixed price overnight. And we, we think that we've got an agreement which um, meets our kind of legal, um, uh, you know, kind of obligations around that. Okay, thank you. Carol, Carol, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, we're the, we're the same, we're the direct provider for the majority of services in Shetland and we've we're, uh, already been paying the, the living wage, so the Scottish Government funding has been adequate for Shetland. Thank you. You said there was a cap of 16.50 an hour, is that, uh, tell me how that operates? So we went out with a tender process where there was a, all of the providers were able to tender in um, a, a, a hourly rate that they required so most so, of them came in uh, sort of within a sort of a few pence of the £16.50. So was that, a, did you agree that rate with them that sixteen fifty would be the hourly rate? That was a rate that we agreed locally as a team that we would use as a as an adequate benchmark for that um, tender process that we undertook. And did they, did they know that when they tendered? Yes, they knew yeah, that. So everybody knew that sixteen fifty was yeah. the rate. Yeah. yeah that, so we've, we've, we've done a lot of work um, engaging with our providers locally around their cost of, of provision and particularly how that links in with the more rural packages where mm -hmm. travel time we were we were getting sort of I suppose signs that that was a really big issue for some of the providers. Thanks that's helpful. Colin. Thanks very much convener. Can I uh, refer to my register of interest uh, where I was a, a local councillor up until um, the 4th of May in, in Dumfries and Galloway so I would have been involved in the, uh, the council's budget setting, setting process. Um, can, can I just ask the, the panel, um, well, first of all, good morning, and uh, can I ask, have your budgets been set for the forthcoming year in each of your IGB areas? Yes, ours have been set and agreed. Uh, in Western Bartonshire, we have uh, an agreement on the, in, uh, the council's <coughs> contribution. Uh, we are still in discussion with the health board in terms of their contribution, but the, at our last meeting, the uh, the, the variation in terms of the NHS budget, we, we did set the budget uh, on the basis that we would have continued discussions and uh, any pressure around that, which was somewhere about a quarter of a million pounds, we would cover from reserves as necessary. Okay, yes, we've got an agreed budget within Dumfries and Galloway. Is your budget agreed? Uh, yes, we agreed the budget, but there is a, a deficit on the NHS side. Okay. To, just, just on that, that process then, the budget's been agreed in, in some areas, but not, not all areas. Um, has that included identifying all the savings that you require for the forthcoming year, or do you have any, any gaps in those budgets? Yeah, I'll start. Um, from the Council perspective in Western Bartonshire, we had no savings. Well, we had no... Uh, we used, in terms of the amount that the 
each council was allowed to reduce in terms of its allocation, uh, in terms of the, the rules that were set out in Parliament. Uh, we did, that meant that we had money left or that we hadn't uh, implemented or hadn't used uh, recurrently from the 16-17 allocations which went to the bottom line. But we've actually not had to make any cuts from that perspective. On the NHS side, we're currently looking at a 2% turnover target to meet the requirements of the, the, the flat cash. And I said there's about a quarter million pounds that we're still in discussion with the health board around. Go next? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, from an Angus perspective, um, we had a full set of efficiency plans considered by the IGB in April that were approved. We have um, short, a, a small shortfall um, in terms of the NHS Tayside uh, budget agreement um, of around £49,000 in identifying efficiency savings and a similar shortfall with the Angus Council settlement, but that's more in the region of uh, 200000 in terms of the efficiency plans that we need to identify more significant to Angus and the Tayside partnerships across um, NHS Tayside is the shortfall that's estimated in the devolved budget around prescribing in Tayside currently, um, which for Angus at the moment um, currently has a shortfall of over a million pounds. Okay. Um, within Dumfries and Galloway, we've currently got a five million um, gap on savings identified. We're working through um, what we agreed with our integration joint board, a, a business transformation programme where we're setting up various kind of programmes of, of service redesign that we will, we're progressing to kind of work through how we will um, sort of bridge that gap. Um, what I undertook as chief finance officer over the last kind of six to nine months was a, a range of workshops with our integration board members, just setting out the scale of the challenge that, that we expected remembering that within Dumfries we've got the whole of acute services within there so some of the the pressures that um, sit primarily with NHS boards are now within the the totality of the integration joint board in in Dumfries and Galloway so recognize we've still got progress to make to, to kind of close that gap and just recognizing that that there will be a range of, of difficult and challenging decisions that we'll need to make as a partnership moving forward. Carol? Yeah, in Shetland we've got a, a balanced budget on the local authority side, but we've got a 2.5 million um, funding gap in the NHS side, and that's uh, that's about six percent of the total IGB budget. We have identified savings plans um, of 1.2 million, but we've still got 1.3 million unidentified. So um, it's still a very challenging position for our seventy million. And to the council side. And the health board side, but isn't it supposed to be an integrated budget? I mean, my, my perception of, of the process is that at, instead of the IGBs setting the budget and determining how much money you require, what is actually happening is that the council set aside how much they're allocating and the health board set aside how much they're allocating, but it sounds as if it actually even goes further than that and that the health board effectively decide what savings they're making and the council appear to make uh, judgments on what could be saved from their allocation. I thought it was supposed to be an integrated budget. Why, why are you talking about the council allocation and the health board allocation and having different gaps between the two? I'll, I'll start. I think, well, the reality is that's how the funding for uh, integration authorities is set up. We, we have two sources of funding. It comes from the local authority and it comes from the, the health board. Uh, I know in previous evidence sessions people have, uh, have suggested that there should be a single process, perhaps directly from Parliament, with a, uh, uh, but uh, the reality is, is, is not that. That's uh, you know, all the due diligence and setting up partnerships to start with. The due diligence work looked at the amount of uh, funding that had been uh, uh, previously used for that purpose from the Council and from the, the Health Board and to satisfy themselves that, that was the, 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 the money allocated was fit for purpose. Once it comes to us, then we have a, we, we're duty bound to, as I say, it loses its identity from that perspective. It's pooled. We're able to use it in a, in a more flexible way. But in terms of the original allocations, they still come from councils and uh, uh, health boards. But the government will argue that actually you have the authority to determine how much you require to implement your strategic plan. So are you saying in practical terms, frankly, that's just a piece of theory that's not being used? You, you're not really, as an IGB, saying 
that actually we believe we need X amount from the local authority and X amount from the health board to deliver our strategic plan. Therefore, that's our budget. Because that, what the, the government will argue, that's what the powers that they've given you allows you to do. But what you're really saying is that actually you just wait to see what the health board and the council give you, and then you decide how you're going to allocate that funding. Is that that's what's really happening in practical terms? I think what, when we get our allocations, we are then able to look at how we best meet our priorities within our strategic uh, for our strategic plan. But the initial allocations. Can only come from uh, as, as current can only come from those two places, but we we I'm certainly not aware of any place else who has done that. I suppose that more initial needs element of saying this is what we think our population needs. Please go back to our funders, to councils and boards, and say this is what we need. Please give us it. I'm, I'm happy to follow on um, again from an Angus perspective, and I would endorse Keith's comments about. Once the money is devolved, um, then we certainly are using that in, with more flexibility locally, and we're certainly investing quite significantly in social care from the totality of the resources that are delegated to us. Um, I think one dynamic that exists in Angus, I'm not sure if it exists anywhere else, um, which requires us to retain, if you like, that, that the, the description of a health resource and a local authority resource was the risk sharing agreement that we entered into through the integration scheme for the first two years. So for the first two years that the IGB is operational, we entered into an agreement with both the NHS board and the local authority that there would be a risk sharing agreement in terms of any overspends uh, relating to the costs of health and social care. So that does require us to maintain um, systems for being able to record and articulate the spend against health services and local authority services should we be required to draw on that risk-sharing agreement. Um, but there is recognition uh, that moving forward, we want to uh, move forward in the spirit of the guidance of establishing IJBs and have more of an integrated approach to the negotiation around budgets. The question around um, you know, who sets the budget or who negotiates it, I guess, is an, is, is an interesting one. And from the experience of the past couple of years, I think the due diligence process itself has been very helpful in identifying an adequate and a fair budget and has been very helpful in those negotiations in terms of reaching budget settlement. But there is no denying that although we are an integration authority, we are partners with the local authority and the NHS board as well. And we are therefore not immune to the efficiency programmes which they've got to put into place to provide sustainable care and we have to be part and par parcel of those. So they all, if you like, play out during the negotiations that we've had for the initial year and certainly for 17-18 as well. Can I just come back on that point? In your evidence, your written evidence, you seem to imply though what you'd prefer as a system of direct funding from government. You, say, you, you talk about the frustrations of having separate partners, but you imply in your written evidence that, that, that almost direct funding model might be better. Um, I think some, certainly some of the information that we put forward has um, supported the approach taken this year, which has been uh, more national direction given in terms of the resources which will be directed towards IGBs. That has really helped local discussions um, because it's been fairly unequivocal. So uh, I think our preference would be um, that there is more direction that enables us to have um, a fair starting position for those negotiations, moving on in the future, if at all possible, to direct allocations to IGBs. Sorry, I don't want to sound like Jeremy Paxman, but, but I'll come back in at that point. But, um, so what, how would you therefore ensure there was democratic local accountability if everything was, was funded directly by the Scottish Government instead of through local authorities? Well. I guess um, we'd, we'd have to consider that in terms of the makeup of the IGBs, um, but certainly the preference at the moment, if, if there was one, was to, would be to continue along the lines of experience last year of more national direction in terms of the allocation to flow through the two bodies to the IGBs. I think we also said in the evidence that, um, if you like, the, the precedent set this year of allocating funds through the NHS boards, but with clear directions, is one that we would um, like to see continue. Is that the view of all the panel, that you would prefer the money to come directly to the Scottish Government? And can I also ask, maybe when you're answering that, if you personally come from the health side background or the local government background? I'll 
go next, if that's okay. Um, my, my background is both. Uh, I've managed health and social work services across both local government and the health service for the last 30 years. Um, so I have, I, I've had a, a experience of work, working both in councils exclusively managing social work services and then moving to the health service and then finally into a, a, a joint position. Um, my IGB hasn't, hasn't come to a view about direct funding or not, so uh, you know, uh, the view I would give would be, would be personal. I, I would share Vicky, Vicky's view that uh, for the new money that's been invested, having clarity around that about what it can and can't be use, uh, used for is incredibly helpful, particularly at a time of financial challenge for the whole of the public sector. I think in some respects, the, albeit that we are body corporate, bodies corporate in, uh, you know, in, 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 in substance from that point of view, but um, you know, the reality is in terms of the directions that the IGB directs then councils and, and, and health boards in terms of what they want the, the money spent on. I think there's some inevitability over time to with potential for IGBs to become the direct employers of, all, uh, of the staff. Uh, to have that direct funding, that's, that's one solution to uh, if people perceive the, notion, the current notion, uh, method of allocating funding from both through local government and, uh, and, and health boards as, as being problematic. That would be the most obvious one, in my, in, in my opinion. But I think, um, I, I think these things can work. Um, and I think from an authority, we, we were running an integrated service since 2010. So the actual the budget negotiation process that we've gone through in the last couple of years hasn't necessarily been any more difficult than it, than it was previously. Um, so we've worked through a number of those issues. We've had the time to, to, to do that. So I think there, there's always going to be a, a bit of negotiation around that. But if people are, come to that with a, uh, with, with a common sense of un, uh, understanding and say, coming from an area that has been broadly supportive of integration and what that's trying to achieve, that's not been a particularly difficult one for us. Katie? I'll, I'll pick up. I suppose it's quite well documented that one of the things that we've asked for over, over the years is to try and get greater alignment between council and NHS budget setting processes so there's no inevitable delays in the process. And I suppose with my, um, sorry, I'm, I'm from a health background and I suppose I'll declare an interest. I'm also the NHS Director of Finance in Dumfries and Galloway, so I have a dual role. Um, that one of the things that, that we want to ensure is that those timelines are as early as possible in, in the year, because I think we've seen um, later and later kind of um, budget timelines for agreeing that, and that, that makes our jobs more difficult in, in terms of agreeing a financial planning piece. I suppose the other thing that, that I would want to make a plea for is to try and get a, a sort of a longer term kind of financial direction, even if it's only indicative, because that... Uh, you know, again, the ambition is that we don't plan on, a, on an annual cycle. Some of these sort of service changes, some of the, the sort of resource shifts are inevitably going to take a longer time to do that. And the, the greatest certainty that we have of resources over a sort of, a, say, a three to five year timeline linking with the timeline for the strategic plan would be, um, would be welcomed. Carol? Yeah, well, I've also got a dual role. I'm Head of Finance for the NHS and IHB Chief Financial Officer. So speaking from the IHB side, I'd say the direct funding is welcome because it safeguards the IHB budget um, and it drives to shift in the shift in the balance of care as well. But I'd say from, from the NHS side, it's probably not so helpful because, as I said earlier, um, we've got the, the fixed costs in the acute hospital. So if we've got to protect the IHB budget uh, puts the savings dis disproportionately onto the acute services, which are already um, almost at a minimum. So I, I would say helpful from IHB side, um, perhaps not so much from the NHS side. Tom. Just picking up on uh, what's been said, it seems almost that the, the aspiration with IGBs is that it should be a, a pro the creation of them should be a process rather than an event. Um, I just wonder, within the um, current um, funding model, uh, what do you think the limits are in achieving the autonomy and independence that I think we all recognise that IGBs require if they truly are to deliver on their aims? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carol, would you like to go first? Uh, 
Do you have nothing? I'm not. Yeah. Um, I guess it's about good partnership working and being mindful that each organisation has, has also got their own efficiency targets to meet. And I guess it's just about a good partnership working. I don't know if I can say any more at this point. Is, is it a question of partnership working? And that's always going to come down to the individual partners involved. So there's likely to be that variance. I look at the experience that we've had in Dumfries and Galloway. The success of our partnership to date has been on, on the effective relationships between our local authority and NHS partners and how that works. And that's not, that's not going to go away depending upon what happens with the, the, sort of the arrangements within the, the, the IJB. So I think one of the things that I think we need to be clear is, is to, to look at where the integration board sits within the, the kind of current climate. So one of the things that's happening within health is a much more greater shift towards regional planning and, and how that how that's going to work. And I think um, we need to be quite clear that um, where the decision making is happen happening. And I suppose reflecting on, on one of the points that, that um, Colin made earlier around how do we ensure that um, the decision making is happening in a, a sort of a locally democratic kind of way. One of the things that we've tried to do in Dumfries is, is delegate as much of our budgets to our localities. We've reinforced our locality structure and, and getting that locality management. So that's one of the sort of the aims that we see as really important is getting that um, ownership within the communities of some of the service changes that we're taking forward. And I think that for me is the, one of the, the real important strands of what it is we're trying to achieve. I certainly share your view around it's, it's, a, it's a process rather than, than an event. As I said earlier, we've, um, albeit in 2015 with the new legislation, the, the governance and bits and pieces changed ar around that. But for us, we've been working on the in integration uh, for a, a long period of time. Formally, since 2010, um, we actually had integrated community care management arrangements since 2008. So we've we've been at this a, a, a long time, and I think we've been able to work through a lot of those things. So things like efficient management efficiencies. I was the CHP director in West Dunbartonshire from 2005, and I now have a smaller management team to manage the totality of the IGB's business all of what was health, community health, all of what was social work, uh, you know, we're, we're making, you know, you know, half a million pounds saving and have been making half a million pounds savings in management costs alone for the last uh, for the last seven years. So I think, you know, there will be opportunities for uh, for others in there. But for, I say for us, that's been a process time to work that through to establish that trust and those relationships that uh, uh, that are vital to, to making that work. And, uh, you know, that we would certainly advocate along the lines you're suggesting there that this is something that will evolve and develop as, as we as, as we go forward on the idea of moving to a, a direct funding model the issue of democratic accountability has already been raised what other challenges would you envisage in moving to such a model Sorry. Yeah, I suppose there's quite well established resource allocation formulas for how health boards and local authorities receive their funding. So, you know, you would have to almost start again with that and there would be the, the sort of the, the whole equity and fairness. And I suppose that would be uh, incredibly challenging around that, I would say. Um, and to build on, I think it was a comment that Keith made earlier on um, and perhaps the comments around um, these becoming more independent bodies. There are a whole range of other things that we would need to consider, in in, including the employment status of the people who work within the health and social care partnership. Um, and I guess, you know, um, at, the, at the risk of being slightly contradictory in nature, um, I'd like to also build on comments from, from Katie and Tim Friesen Gallery in terms of where we focused our effort to date. Our effort has absolutely been invested in building good, strong local partnerships through the localities and building the relationships with the people that actually provide care and integrating that at the point of delivery. And there's been less focus, I guess, on trying to create total independence of a new integration authority. And I think that's as a result of a range of issues, notwithstanding the fact that we are part of the local authority and also um, the NHS board locally. And we have a series of interdependencies that are still as a result of that many of the corporate services that we use are provided by um, the parent bodies. But moreover, and again referring to the reference to regionalisation, 
Um, our experience over the first year of operation and moving into to this year has shown that we have interdependencies to create beyond our own boundaries. And there is a larger requirement for us as IGBs to work regionally now on the pressure points that we have. So I think the focus for us is build on the local partnerships and then create the wider regional partnerships that we need to sustain ourselves. Would it be fair to say then on that, that point that the uh, potential for integration is only limited by the uh, capacity for partnership between individual local authorities and health boards? Um, well, certainly from my perspective, if you like, the effectiveness or, or the capability of the partnership is absolutely under, underpinned by really good local partnerships. So I guess the flip side of that would say that, um, um, you know, if you like, the potential is, is within the grasp of the, uh, the quality of the relationships locally, absolutely. It's not necessary around the systems, it's more around the relationships, leadership and good local partnership in my view. So rather than necessarily having to move to a direct funding model, really the focus should just be on making sure we can get these partnerships working as effectively as possible. I would agree with that, yeah. Uh, Ivan. Uh, thanks, Irina. Thanks, panel, for coming along. Um, there was a couple of things I just wanted to get a bit more clarity on. You may, you may or may not be able to help. Um, the first was around the overall level of the budgets. Um, so I'm looking at the... Um, the, the total NHS Scotland health budgets 2016, 17, 2017, 18. Um, and I'm looking at the comments in your submissions round about um, the health boards being instructed to give you a, a, an allocation in 2017, 18 that was flat in terms of cash. Whereas if you look at the, the total NHS budget for Scotland, it's up by, in cash terms, 270 million over that period, 2.1% and in real terms by 80 million or 0.6 per cent. So the health boards in total are getting increases in, in cash terms and in real terms, but from the comments I'm seeing, they've been told to only give you the same level in cash terms. Are those two statements correct? And if so, where's the rest of the money going to the health boards hanging on to that for something else? Or what's the, what's the context of that? I suppose just in terms of the um, the overall numbers around health, there was obviously 100 million from the health budget that was directed as part of the settlement into social care. So within Dumfries and Galloway, 3 million of the, the funding that the health board received. Um, so part of that 270 million that you talked about has already gone across to, to the integration bo boards as part of the partnership. That wasn't sort of counted in the in the number that's talked about in terms of the cash flat settlement, um, which really left NHS boards with, with a relatively small uplift, around about 0.4% in terms of their increases. And that that's part of the, the challenge around why we're seeing the level of savings. As you're getting the, the, the local authority money we've talked about, you're getting the health board money flat in cash terms, plus you're getting this extra £100 million so, on top of that yeah, as so well. integration boards would have got the flat, flat cash and the, um, the share of the £100 million, which And £100 million has come through the health boards or has it come yeah. direct to you? It's come through the health board. Right, OK. So I mean, looking at Dumfries and Galley, for example, and your, your number's gone up £6 million between 2016-17 mm -hmm. to 17-18, and you're saying £3 million of that £6 million went through you as part of this 100 million to yeah. the It'll IGB. be a combination of the social care fund and the full year impact of that from 15, seven, 15 16, sorry, the 3 million and any kind of other kind of ring fence funding, funding that we've had through the integrated care fund and how that's played into the budget position. Right, so the model's even more complicated than it first it appears. Yeah. Okay, so you've got money coming through, the local authorities you've got money coming through the health boards and flat cash terms, and you've got other pockets of money yeah. coming through the health boards that are allocated yeah. specifically for, yeah. for the IGBs on top of that. Okay, um, fine. Is, uh, I'm just touching on the points that, 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 that Tom and Colin made about where this evolves to, and saying it's a process. It kind of sounds like it's something that's sort of already creaking under the, 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 the uh, complexity and the add-ons and the bits and pieces that are getting bolted on top of other bits and pieces that are there, and I'm assuming that will kind of evolve as we go. Is there a danger that this thing just gets too complicated? Oh, certainly, uh, I don't think so. Right, um, okay. I think at, at, at first glance, but I suppose being in it, 
Yeah. It, 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 you know, we, we I suppose we we should at least understand how uh, how that sure. works. Uh, and I think the, as we've said all, earlier, I think the clarity around uh, in terms of specific additional allocations, my. My recollection, although I may, I miss, may be wrong, was that, for example, in 1617, the 250 million for social care, my recollection was that was over and above any uplift that went to health boards, whereas the 107 for 1718 is part of the, right. the health board's total uplift. So that was a that was a my colleague Katie can keep me right if that uh, on that. Okay. So that was that has a, that's a slight additional complication, but I said we, we we understand that, and I suppose that goes back to your original question of why it looks like mm -hmm. um, uh, you, you, there is so little what's happening in that extra money. Well, certainly as far as my health board, by the time they flowed through the share of the 107 uh, the, the 107 million for Greater Glasgow and Clyde, I think there was something in the single figures of millions left of the uplift to cover. Uh, all inflationary pressures. Okay. Um, following on from that, then, if you, this concept of set aside, I think we're, we're talking about what you're calling large hospitals, which my understanding of the definition of a large hospital is a hospital that covers more than one local authority or more than one IGB area. If I'm correct, is that is that how it's defined? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Right. Okay. No. So it could be just allocated for one, or it could be across several. Right, um, and from just reading through the notes here, the um, the way that money seems to work, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but the concept seems to be that the hospitals need money to run, the hospitals are providing services that the IGBs need, the IGBs aren't funding those through a, a transfer of resources, but the health board has got that money to start with, but rather than give it to the IGB to give back to the hospital, the health board just keeps the money and gives it direct to the hospital, and part of the hospital's funding is coming through that set aside process and part of it's coming directly from the health board. Is that how the process works? Um, I suppose it's, it's fair to say that the set aside piece for um, this first year of operation has, has almost been like a, a notional allocation. So what, what, um, what health boards have done in conjunction with their IJBs is, is worked out through their sort of costing mechanism, the, the sort of the, the amount of resource based on the, the services that are directed through the integration scheme that would be allocated to that partnership, um, with a view to kind of looking at how that can impact on, on you know, kind of acute services. What we've done in Dumfries is, is we don't have set aside budgets because we've got all of our acute hospital yeah, budget one. within within that. There's a piece of work that's going on through the um, with the policy team in, in government and the chief finance officers network to look at how we make that a bit more real. Because I mean, it's probably fair to say for um, both Vicky and Keith, it probably hasn't felt real in the first year in terms of how how that impacts on the overall resources that um, each of the integration joint boards have, have got. But it, it is to give the IGBs a, an, an impact and, a, and an influence on on the delivery of acute services within their, um, within their region. Which obviously makes sense because the whole point, as we yeah. started with, is to move the resources from acute and to yeah. the social care side. But obviously, as you make that more real, that throws up another problem, which is if you're trying to manage a hospital and you're not sure where your money's coming from and you're having to negotiate with several IGBs, I think it's even more complicated, especially if you get big fixed costs as you do in a hospital. Is there any thought when given as to how that's going to play out? Carol, on that point. Of course. Carol, can I bring you in on that? Um, well, in Shetland, we put the set-aside budget. Um, that was it. That was passed to the IGB at the start of the year as part of the delegated budget. So, um, because we've just got one local authority and one hospital, then we just put in the, the full cost centres that relate to emergency care. So we had A and E, Ward Three, and the, the medical doctors and consultants. That all went into the IGB. And I guess our thoughts there is that allows the IGB to consider the whole system. Um, and if there was any funding decisions that impacted the, the hospital, that would need to be carefully discussed between. Health board and IGB. I mean, that's where the, the partnership work in, comes in. You wouldn't you wouldn't expect them to uh, remove funding without the proper process to ensure that that is um, moving the balance of care um, in the correct manner. Yeah, I can understand. In the case of Shetland and Dumfries and Galloway, where you've got that alignment, a one-to-one -one alignment, you can sit down with yourself and figure it out. I'm more concerned about what it looks like in the case where the large hospital servicing several IGBs 
and how that's supposed to work when you start having a real control over that budget and deciding what you are or aren't going to put into the acute hospitals and how acute hospitals are supposed to manage themselves in that environment. So, yeah. From a Tayside perspective, I would endorse comments again made around the reality in the first year. In the first year, it has been uh, more of an exercise to describe the, the, the large hospital set aside. I think we articulated in, in the um, information that we put forward we see um, a major area for this year for us to build the financial planning relationships regarding large hospitals. Um, in Tayside, we largely work with Nine Wells Hospitals, and that covers um, three of the Tayside IJBs, but also has an impact on one of the IJBs um, in Fife because of the flow of patients. Um, so we're approaching that this year um, through a round table approach to planning. Um, so it's probably not dissimilar to what colleagues have articulated from Shetland and from East and Galloway in terms of the whole system planning around the table uh, for different components of care. But then we'll have to obviously back up the jointly agreed plans with the financial mechanisms and the planning mechanisms that are set out with large hospital guidance. Major focus for us at the moment in Tayside is around unscheduled care um, and trying to change the pattern of demand there and uh, the costs of care associated with that. So that will flow through into our large hospital guidance and our strategic plans that are emerging over the next year. I would just add to that briefly, Chair. Um, I think that that's one part of the legislation, certainly in, in, in areas where there are more than one IGB within a health board area, the requirement for the, the chief officers and the partnerships to collaborate and cooperate together. Certainly in, in Glasgow, that's something that we are doing, have been doing and will continue to do. So uh, we're, we're currently going through commissioner, developing our commissioning intentions. So we've, co we've worked collectively as a group, a group of six to bring those together to make sure that what one's saying is absolutely consistent with what uh, the rest of us are saying, for example, so we should, and that should make that, so it's a, it becomes a coordinated ask to the, to, to, uh, to, to the acute system rather, rather than having to deal with six, uh, six different uh, arrangements, six times over. Okay. Okay. Uh, Donald. Yes. Uh, good morning. Can I ask about uh, staffing costs? And the, I think the, the starting point for this question is to establish, um, well, firstly, who does uh, who, who directly employs uh, the various um, personnel who who operate functions that the IJBs control? Is it is it the IJB? Uh, is it the health board? Is it the local authority? Or is it a mixture? <laughs> uh, maybe we'll go first mm -hmm. if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, because in terms of the. The background. So the people who previously, uh, for the services that are delegated to us, mm -hmm. if you've been a, an NHS, if you've been a health visitor or a district nurse or a physiotherapist employed by the health board, you can that, that continues. Uh, and the same way, if you've been a home carer or a social worker within the local authority, that continues. So there remain two employers. Um, and okay. I think that's in terms of my response to one of the earlier questions. That's that you know the, uh, the way the legislation is drafted. We remain with two employers, but it is open in, at some point in the future for that to change and for the IGB potentially to become the um, uh, an employer. So um, a, a bit like they've done perhaps in Highland, where for their single agency model they took be transferred all the previous health uh, so, uh, council staff uh, for adult care into the, the board mm -hmm. and vice versa, for, I think, for health visitors and specialist children's services went to the, the, the council. So same same sort of thing. But again, it's been one of those areas. Um, so uh, for simple things like public holidays, <laughs> um, you know, it helps to have coordination around so th those things. There are very few uh, admin staff. We sometimes, you know, there are some inconsistencies sometimes within grades. But in terms of professional employees, I think occupational therapists as a professional group are the only group that historically have had employment in both NHS and, and, and councils. But in reality, they've done quite different jobs. So, but that, that's, the, that, that's the reality of where we are just now. They, they are fundamentally one either with it. And the, the only employee as such as uh, technically as us as chief mm -hmm. officers, where we're effectively seconded. Uh, to the IGB for that purpose in terms of being their, their chief officer. Okay. So, j thank you for clarifying that. Um, so, if, if, for instance, an adult social care worker in Dumfries and Gallery, Galloway, um, or you're a, um, someone working in a hospital in Dumfries and Gallery, all under, um, all delegated to the Integration Authority, 
you will nevertheless be employed either by the council or by the health board. In terms of the budget then, um, who, bears, who, uh, who bears the staffing, that staffing cost? Does it come into your budget, notwithstanding you're not the employer? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And is that is it true, of, true of across the board? Okay, thank you. Yeah, clear. Thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you, panel, um, for coming along this morning. I want to ask a little bit about your annual financial statement. Um, I'm not quite sure when each of the IAs are expected to produce those, so perhaps you could, you could enlighten me. Ours is due to our IGB at the end of June. Thank you. Ours will go to our audit committee in uh, the middle of June. Okay. Um, similarly, we're preparing ours at the moment, and it will go to IGB at the end of June. We're also preparing the, the annual report for the for the IGB as well. Carol. Yeah. End of June, the draft account is going to IGB audit committee and IGB. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I, I note here that um, Scottish Government uh, gave an advice note to uh, IGBs about their annual financial statement. Um, reminding them that regulations require that the report includes financial information on the amount spent on achieving the national health and wellbeing outcomes um, and the amount spent on care groups, localities and service type. And I wonder if you could uh, perhaps uh, inform the committee how your annual financial statement is going to address those issues. Um, I suppose are you are you picking up the fact of how we link financial numbers to yes. to kind of outcomes. I suppose I mean we don't have the the sophistication in our financial systems to provide that level of detail that that's required, and and the actual financial statement is a as a sort of a fairly indicative kind of cost book analysis, splitting our costs across the various. Um, sort of parameters of care, so acute care, primary care and, and locality care. One of the things that we've been having quite a big discussion about in our um, partnership is around how we move the focus away from um, some of the performance indicators that you can count, you know, some of the, the sort of the national stuff around the TTG, a &E waiting times, to link very much more closely with the nine national outcomes. So our kind of performance suite that we've been pulling together um, actually sort of starts to set up how we're, how we're going to do that with much more um, kind of longer term kind of qualitative indicators. Um, the work that we've been doing as a partnership indicates that it's probably going to take a sort of a, a three to five year kind of planning cycle before we get information that really starts to, to note how, um, how that performance moves are, are happening. And I think that's where one of the things that we really want to measure is, particularly when we were talking earlier about the shifting the balance of care um, sort of ambition, um, that we can really start to see over a period of time whether, as, a, as an integration joint board, we're making a real impact on, on the outcomes to patients. And that certainly is, is our ambition. I would say it's still very early days yet in, in terms of the first year of, um, of operation. So from an Angus perspective, the national outcomes that were prescribed um, underpin the overall strategic plan that we've set out and the approach to our strategic plan, um, which is actually then further rationalised into four different domains of change and development. So the concentration uh, locally has been for our financial plans to map the intentions that are set out in the strategic plan. Um, so they will follow those, but they won't necessarily at this point be easily definable against each of the national outcomes. And I think other areas also would find it quite difficult at the moment to map financial resources against each of the individual outcomes. However, um, the main thrust has been to align it to the strategic um, outcomes that have been set out for our IGB. So the plan that you'll see put forward to our IGB in um, June will not only be a financial statement of the expenditure and the use of the budgets, but it will also show you how investment of those budgets have achieved any change against our strategic plan. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm a bit confused there. So does the strategic plan include 
the, the national wellbeing outcomes? It does, yes. But, but, but beyond the uh, original number, within that we've got four different domains of development which we largely map the financial resources against, against. So it does incorporate those. But to drill down to match them identically against the nine national outcomes has proved quite difficult. Um, in terms of aligning the financial resources. I don't know if it's the same elsewhere, but I gather that it's similar across Scotland. Uh, Carol, would you like to comment? Very, we're the same as what uh, Vicky is saying. Um, we are going to try and um, combine the performance report along with the financial statements to see if we can, um, we can begin to link the finances to the outcomes. But as far as detailed mapping between the finances and the national outcomes, we, we still don't have that level of detail. It's a work in progress. Keith, Keith. I obviously share uh, sentiments from my, my, my colleagues. I think our approach is maybe slightly different. I suppose we, um, we, our financial statement and the audit and accounts, etc., will be a a piece that we need to do technically to, to, to do that, and we'd look to, to do uh, in terms of the public report uh, in, in terms of performance, we'd look to take information from that and to build it in in the same way as other people are talking about. But I think it will be an evolutionary process that we will get better at the more, more we do. And certainly something that the, the Chief Officers Network nationally will is certainly an, an area where we could all probably learn from each other in terms of how we develop that over time. So it, it, it sounds to me here that like you, you're, you're very focused on numbers, on figures, on, on um, balancing the books, if you like, as opposed to um, matching that against the national outcomes. Is, is, is this because this is something new? Is it because you've not had adequate guidance? Can you explain to me why, why, why they haven't been linked up already and why we're looking at three to five years before we're going to see that information? Well, one, yes, it's new. Uh, from in, in terms of the legislation from from that perspective so and, and this at the end of the first full year will be the first time that we've all had to do it so I suppose there's an inevitability that there'll be there'll be good and bad uh, in, in, in that perspective um, I think there are it's, uh, the We've explained and people have explained that some of the difficulties in terms of matching it, you know, that just purely against that or some expenditure might uh, match a number of the outcomes, uh, the, the nine national outcomes. So, um, but yes, we are, there's no doubt that we've been focused on, 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 on the numbers and balancing the books and making the most with the money. But at the end of the day, making the most with the money and doing the best with the money is actually not inconsistent at all with those national outcomes, because that's effectively what integration is there, is there to do. Apologies, I've used this anecdote in other places before, but a long time ago when I worked in another part of Scotland, when money was a bit tight, um, I spent three or four years defining, well, the social work department, we only do this. And the health board said, well, we only do that, and nobody cared about the person in the middle. And I suppose that's the biggest difference for me about integration, is it's all about the person in the middle and doing the best we can and the most we can with the totality of what we've got. So managing that money and those resources to the best, its best effect across the piece, with, the, I'd say, with its focus on individuals who need services, is, is what we're about. So how do you evidence that then? Well, the, the, the proof will be when we, when we, 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 I do quarterly reporting to my IGB uh, of, uh, of in, in terms of performance, in terms of some of the indicators around uh, that, that would feed into some of those uh, outcomes as well. So it will, it's been a, that's been an iterative process as well. So, and again, we, we, we were, this is our first, well, we just concluded our first full year, but we had nine months in the previous year. And again, it's been an iterative process for us uh, to, to that so that we, we, we are all about providing that evidence and, and for people to scrutinise that and to see whether or not we're making a difference. And from an Angus perspective, not dissimilarly, we, we also um, submit a quarterly performance report to the IGB and that does align the use of the financial resources against the strategic intent that's set out in the strategic plan. Um, and although it is still a work in progress, um, it's a major focus for us to ensure that we invest the money wisely to achieve the objectives that we've been set up to do. Is there, is there work going on in terms of a standardised, auditable um, set of reporting mechanisms where we can compare you to you to you? Well, it's certainly a national requirement in terms of the annual report, but I think the, the um, interim reporting is at local discretion unless my colleagues know otherwise. So no is the answer, or yes is the answer. I'm There's a sure. standardised approach to the annual report, but not, the annual but, report. Not, but not the interim reporting. So. 
I suppose all I was going to add was that inevitably with the, the nature of the nine national outcomes, they are the things that you can't count as easily. And by default, in terms of the qualitative kind of measures like patient experience and, and things like that, that there is a longer term nature to being able to evidence a, a shift in kind of cultures and changes in, in usage of services. So I think what we've sort of set out, and I know I talked about a three to five year timescale, that, that links very much with the, the outcomes that we've set out as a partnership within our strategic plan. And so at every um, kind of integration board meeting that we have, we have both a financial update and a performance update so that we're focusing equally on both of those measures and, and, and linking our kind of resource allocation very much to where we want to see our performance improve within the, the sort of the outcomes set out in the, in the strategic plan. Uh, yeah, and, and, and finally, uh, thank you, convener. Just to ask, how readily available is that information, the quarterly information? How readily available will the annual information be? I mean, all of our information is, is published on our local website, and I'm happy to share our performance reporting with the committee if they want to see it. Yeah, likewise, our, our, our performance reports are in our IGB papers, which are public and, and, and available from our website. Same. Carol? Yeah, it's the same as it's published on the website. And the quarterly performance report, um, we report against the nine um, national outcomes. Um, and we're the same as what Cathy was saying. We consider the performance report and the finance report together at each meeting. So um, the performance report tells us how well we're performing against those outcomes. And if, if we're staying within our financial plan, then I guess that's the, the balance that we're... Um, we're implementing the strategic plan correctly. Do you then report that back to Scottish Government and they produce coordinated data, or should they be doing that? Comparative data? So do you report your outcomes back to the Scottish Government, and then do they produce anything saying this is what's happening across the piece? I mean, they have set out within the health and social care delivery plan outcomes that we need to report, but they're much more the, the kind of traditional kind of um, outcomes that you would be used to seeing through the NHS. Um, I mean, we could take that back to them because I'm, I'm not quite sure what their intention is around that. Um, okay. um, earlier on, uh, Keith spoke uh, about cuts. Uh, Vicky and Carol spoke about savings and Katie spoke about um, efficiencies. If I was to get a copy of the dictionary and thesaurus that's handed out to IGB managers and looked up cuts or efficiencies or savings, would I find the same explanations under those three words? Are cuts, efficiencies and savings the same things in the lexicon of IGB manager? Not always. Not always, no. Not always, not always. So that, well, I can imagine that if your office uses 10 boxes of paper clips last year and you've got eight left, there's an, um, there's an efficiency to be made there. I understand that. But in the big scheme of things, in the big numbers, when you're asked to find very significant sums of money, mm -hmm. are they cuts, efficiencies or savings? Well, I can only talk on behalf of the, our approach to efficiencies and yeah. their so yours are efficiency. Yeah, well, uh, uh, because they're, they're, they're created to achieve both a reduction in spend, but sometimes more efficient ways of working. So we've been through a major redesign programme this year with uh, home care, health, uh, care that's provided to people at home that has, required, that has um, involved different shift patterns and different ways of working that have actually increased the capacity of yeah. the existing workforce. So you would be doing that? irrespective of the financial situation because it's a better thing for you to do. Uh, you? And it's also an absolute requirement in terms of us keeping up with the demand. Right, that's, that. Yeah. that's that example. Yeah. Which other examples do you have that are not driven by that need but that are driven by financial need? Um, well, I guess there are a range of, um, in, in your words, cost-cutting exercise, which are no, literally no. <laughs> about reducing the expenditure. Yeah. Yeah, so they're, yeah. So so, would, would you describe those as cuts? They're, I guess they're more efficient ways of working. So we don't tend to use the language Keith, around the words cuts. Yeah, certainly. I understand. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. very well aware of that. Yeah. But Keith did use the word cuts earlier. And I think that was quite refreshing because it's the first time I've heard an IGB manager say it. Um, so in your 
experience, your long experience, um, are you having to implement cuts? Well, having used the term, I can't back down from it now, but uh, I think uh, very often when it comes to it, we need to call it, frankly, what, what it is. So, Hallelujah. Um, from, from my perspective, um, flat cash, for example, is a, a much better position and much more protected position than other parts of the public sector in Scotland. But the reality is, is that flat cash across the period of the year means that uh, and most of our control budget becomes into staff. Right, or from, so the reality is, if I have to maintain a flat cash, because the pay bill goes up, the only way I can, as I said earlier, it's a 2% efficiency saving, a 2% slippage target in order to, to, to meet that. Ultimately, that means I will probably have to uh, employ fewer staff at the end of the year than I did at the start of the year. Now, there may be some aspects of efficiency of doing things a bit better that might mitigate some of that, but the reality is, is that most people would recognise that as a... A, a, a potential cut to the level of the service, and that's that's where we're that's that's what, why I use the term. Thank you. Um, I suppose that we will be doing a combination of things. So we will be, you know, sort of buying things cheaper and doing things more efficiently, which is what you would classify as an efficiency. We'll be doing a range of service redesigns, which will um, change the way that we current deliver uh, currently deliver services to either. Why, meet would, up why would you not be demand? buying things? cheaper and more efficiently anyway. We do. I mean, we, en we endeavour to do that. So we will team. always be looking at that as a, as a way to, um, you know, kind of make savings as we move forward. Um, as I say, we will do, um, we'll undertake service redesigns, we'll, we'll, you know, to meet the demands of the service. Um, so, you know, the work that we've been doing around trying to reduce delayed discharges and, and sort of working in, in our sort of hospitals and things, we, we will get... Um, you know, we will change our services to meet those demands, and there will be some things that we'll do that that you might want to describe as cuts or, or budget reductions. So we on, might go stop on, just say doing it. things. You know, we we might stop prescribing something. We're looking at at some of the the things that you know where we where we've got that balance of of value for money. I mean, as a chief finance officer, we have to look at our resources across the whole piece and, and look at the population that we're providing the services to. So it, it, there's no doubt that there will be need to be some difficult decisions made within partnerships. Um, okay. We've not shied away from that. Thank you. Carol? Danielle, we're also trying to redesign the services to do more with less, so like moving beds from residential beds and move the service into the community. Um, I guess the the difficulty is to, to convince the public that we are maintaining the level of service if we're, if we're reducing costs. But I guess ultimately, as budgets keep getting reduced, there might be a, a, we might get to the position that we need to, to make cuts and, and reduce services. Um, in Shetland, that might mean moving more procedures to the mainland, move towards more regional models. But um, at the moment, the efficiencies we're trying to drive but ultimately, we could come to the stage of this um, probably more classed as cuts, I guess. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the delay in uh, green budgets and stuff like that, uh, does that have any implications for day-to-day -day budgeting for people in the front line? Or uh, is it largely they just go on with it and let you guys worry about that? Yes, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alex. Good morning to the panel. I'd like to explore uh, the convenience question a little further in terms of cuts and efficiencies. Having worked um, in the social care sector for the best part of 15 years, I understand uh, that efficiencies don't always mean cuts. I mean, I remember being told to box clever in terms of travel and people to join meetings in the way that Carl is doing uh, from Shetland a lot more frequently. And that's an efficiency that reduces quite a significant burden on any organisation's budget. Uh, but then you move to the point where efficiencies means that things you used to do are no longer delivered, and that's a cut. That's when the service user at the business end of what you're doing no longer gets the value of that uh, process. Now, I understand that, and, um, and we can debate the semantics. What I'm really interested in ex exploring right now is this sort of the quiet death of services where it's nobody's fault. So, for example, um, the 20% reduction to drug and alcohol partnerships that came through in the budget 18 months ago and is perpetuated in this year's budget, which was effectively a 20% cut that was passed on to 
IJBs, and effectively they were told to say, well, please just find a way to continue doing what you were doing, but with less money. Some, um, some authorities, some uh, health boards and IJBs have, to their credit, managed to do that. But in Edinburgh, for example, we've seen a net reduction of £1.3 million a year in terms of funding for drug and alcohol services, and some services have ended as a result of that. Um, I just want to hear the, the views of the panel on what happens when, you know, why is there, why do some authorities manage to do that and others not? Um, and why is no fuss made about it when that happens? Because it seems to me that's the point at which it's nobody's fault um, and we lose services, but nobody seems to be to blame for that. Perhaps I could come in first. I think um, my recollection of la last year was that the you know, the, there was a, a change in the in the way it was accounted for, and there was, a, as you say, a, a significant reduction, and with a a, a a desire to see that continue. When we're at, and, and my health board did, um, we did we, we we did actually make at a local level some efficiencies. We we discussed with our main voluntary sector providers and our own direct provision there, and we, you know, that the my recollection of our share would have been something like three hundred thousand pounds hit on a. On a four million or so, three million or so budget, um, we we made a number of changes that resulted in a hundred thousand pounds being taken out of the, uh, with in working in conjunction with our two major providers, and I said uh, cutting our own cloth a bit uh, in, in terms of our own direct provision. Um, it certainly wasn't as the chair of the ADP uh, in, in, in my area. It was certainly not uh, forgotten about or hidden. It was certainly we, we did that in a very open and transparent way. And people would have ideally not liked to do it, but there was, we, we were able to do it in a way that, with both the providers and ourselves, we were able to, by and large, manage to continue to provide the most, uh, the most significant of services. Do you want to follow up on that? No, I'm grateful for that. I think um, my frustration with this entire issue, particularly around ADP funding, is it's something that myself, the convener, and others have raised successively in Parliament, because we are not keen to give up on this without a fight. Um, but it's felt like um, we've, we've looked sometimes to health boards and um, IJBs for support in that fight. And some health boards have managed to do as you have done. And some have just thrown their hands up and said, well, there's nothing we can do. We're just going to have to reduce the funding. Um, and I, just, I think my frustration is that th this just it seems to have just happened. And, uh, and we're just expected to um, accommodate that. And yet we can see a correlation with a, a spike in HIV infection in Glasgow as a result of um, reductions in um, services, um, in, which is causal. We, we have yet to see how exactly empirical evidence as to how causal that is. But nevertheless, you know, the, so those services which were keeping people safe are no longer doing so to the level they were. I, I guess it's just a, a point I'd like to have on record, Camille. Okay, I think we're going to finish there. We've went a bit over time. Could I thank you all very much for your evidence? Could I also say I understand uh, Keith, you're retiring uh, at the summer, so could we um, put on record there? Um, thanks to you for your contribution to health and social care over, I think it's a quite a long period of time, so uh, uh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> thank you, Camille. And we'll just spend briefly.
Okay, second item on our agenda this morning is our first uh, uh, evidence session on NHS governance, um, and we'll be looking at staff governance today. Could I welcome to the committee uh, uh, Donald Harley, Deputy Scottish Secretary of the BMA, Ross Shaw, Senior Officer, Royal College of Nursing, Scotland, Kenneth Lloyd-Jones, uh, Public Affairs and Policy Manager for Scotland Office of the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy and a representative of the Allied Health Professions uh, Federation in Scotland. Matt McLaughlin, Secretary to the Health Committee of Unison, and Claire Puller, National Officer, Managers in Partnership. Uh, we did um, seek a representative from Unite the Union, but they were unable to uh, put someone forward. Could I, um, first of all, declare an interest as a member of Unite the Union, and just put that on the record? Um, and we'll move direct to first questions. Could I ask uh, Colin? Thanks, Convener, and uh, good morning to the, the panel. Um, can I ask... Uh, members of the panel, what role does staff governance play in delivering an effective workforce uh, and how would you rate the NHS's performance on staff governance? Would you like to go well, first? I, I'm happy, happy to do so, I guess. Um, I'd like to put on the record that we're fully, we're fully committed to the staff governance uh, um, arrangements in, in, in Scotland and the, and the ideals underpinning them are um, very good indeed, but I think we would say is that there, there are definitely areas, um, both functional areas and probably board areas as well, where there's marked difference between the real, practical reality on the ground and the, the ideals contained in the, uh, in the standard. And I suppose there are, th there are three uh, main areas that uh, we would uh, want to uh, flag up. Um, the first is all around engagement and involvement. Um, whereas uh, Scotland has a proud record in, 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 uh, with regard to that, and a recent study by the University of Nottingham um, uh, gave, gave Scotland high marks in, 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 indeed for the arrangements it has. Um, but oftentimes in practice, it doesn't. It, it doesn't fulfill the function it ought to do because there's an element of uh, rubber stamping around things in that fully formed ideas are, br are brought to be validated rather than involving staff from the, from the bottom up. And in terms of, of, of medical staff who, who I'm representing today, uh, they find it particularly hard to be released, uh, to be engaged. It's not easy to provide uh, cover for, for, for medical staff, and uh, it, this is a long-standing thing, but as finances become tighter in the NHS, um, it becomes even harder to release medical staff, and it requires a bit of planning and foresight. Six weeks' notice, typically, to uh, release a, a, a consultant um, and somebody uh, there to, to cover for them. Uh, for GPs in particular, uh, Mondays is the busiest day in practice. Uh, it's also the busiest day in clinics, in, in hospitals as, as, as well. And yet all too often we see joint arrangements being organised for a Monday, which effectively, um, uh, 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 unintentionally or otherwise, um, excludes uh, medical involvement and engagement. And thereby you're losing that practical frontline experience, the chance to uh, improve services from um, from that uh, perspective. Uh, the, the second area I would like to highlight is that of uh, raising um, concerns. And there's a lot of uh, stuff you'll have read in the evidence about um, how uh, effective the arrangements are for raising concerns in, in general. And I'll not, I'll not rehearse that again uh, just now. Um, but just to flag up, there's a particular unique situation with regards to uh, junior doctors whose training programmes are controlled by NHS Education for Scotland and therefore they exercise um, considerable power over uh, juniors' access to... The issues around concerns being raised across the piece, so you maybe hold fire on that for now. Is that OK? Okay, happy okay. to do that. So, uh, Matt. Yeah. 
Thanks, convener. I mean, I think the first thing I would say is staff governance says is is a very clear ideology that was developed in partnership with uh, trade unions and the employer and, and government of the day. And I think that has uh, continued. I think a lot of people invest a lot of time and effort to try and make sure that that continues. What I would say is that I think that that ideology, that principle, um, is starting to feel the strain, partly because some of the people who crafted it have retired, gone, left um, the service. Um, I think uh, the continued budget pressure, it doesn't help. Um, and I think it's easy to do partnership working and staff governance when you're in a period of growth because you've got good things to say to people. It's much, much harder when you're doing that in a period of, of retraction and change. And so I think that does it is affecting the current performance um, as, as particularly middle managers, I think, feel squeezed to deliver. And so we hear lots of stuff about ticking boxes and consuming your own smoke and all of that kind of mantra starts to feed through. Um, when in the past, I think people were much more inclined to try to engage and talk positively and had time and energy and space to listen. I think other colleagues have spoken about uh, in their submissions the need for training uh, and... Uh, um, of, of that group of staff, and I think that, 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 that that's, a, that's a very a good a, a thing to identify and focus on, because I think that is a key a, issue. Um, I would say there's been a more a recent a, summary or, or, or analysis undertaken by Penn State University, which I think is in the system a, somewhere, and that also speaks very highly of partnership, and in particular the staff governance model. It is unique a, to Scotland and Scotland's NHS, and the interaction and interfaces we work in the integrated joint boards is absolutely challenging that agenda, a, because we have another a big complex beast involved in uh, joint boards who don't necessarily have at its heart that, that, that staff governance uh, uh, commitment. So I think that's something that needs to be worked through a bit more. Um, but, but generally speaking, um, I think uh, the report card would say, um, you know, ticking along nicely, but, but needs a bit of focus. Uh, Ross? Um, I would agree. I would say that nationally, the staff governance standard in Scotland is strong and the tripartite agreement with the Scottish Government, the employers and the trade union works really well at a national level. However, I think we would question how aware staff on the ground floor are of the staff governance standard. I think they become aware when something happens, if there's going to be an organisational change in their area, and they suddenly have to become aware. But I think we all, and I, I mean the, the, the tripartite agreement, the three lots of us, all struggle to ensure that we get the positive messages out there, because sometimes there's some really good work done with, with, within staff governance, with the engagements with the trade unions. However, that doesn't, message doesn't always get out there to staff. It's extremely difficult for nursing staff to actively engage often because they're under immense pressure. We all know how busy the clinical areas are, both in the hospitals and in the community. We've got huge vacancies at the moment, both within the community and within the, the hospitals. So that puts incredible pressure on. The complexity of patients is so, so huge that it's actually very difficult to get staff to be come actively involved. So I would um, question whether it's working as well on the ground floor. I would echo some of those last points. I think we're, we're um, very pleased that the, uh, the, the, the partnership arrangement in Scotland is, is a good, positive model, um, which has, has worked and uh, obviously will feel greater strains in, in a period in which uh, budgets are tight. Um, I would add from the allied health professions perspective, they feel, I think, a little more disadvantaged in that traditionally, for example, at a local level, there isn't backfill for um, uh, allied health professions to take on uh, roles that aren't directly dealing with patients. So uh, in order to engage, they have to often cancel appointments. That's the reality of it, which is not the case in, in, in other areas where cover is arranged for that. Um, and I think also just in terms of things like uh, continuing professional development, where um, uh, courses will have to be funded by allied health professions themselves. There isn't uh, funding very often made available for that um, and, and getting release for that can be sometimes restricted. So I think in many ways the, the allied health professions do feel uh, somewhat disadvantaged uh, in the overall picture. 
Claire. I have to agree with my colleagues. I think that the, the tripartite agreement is a very good and strong agreement. However, I don't always feel that that is delivered to all the employers, and I don't think that that cascades down through the employers. For, so the work that's done at the tripartite level doesn't always reach the people who are working in the NHS. I do agree that it's time-consuming if, if there's something, so not just a reorganisational change, but if you're looking at something where you're raising a grievance or there's something going on along the lines where there's actually complaints and dispute between colleagues, that can take years to sort out. And one of my worries is that sometimes when we're going through governance, what we should be saying is, what do we want to achieve by, by starting to use this particular framework? So if you're using something, for example, for reorganisational change, we know why we're using that. We know that there's going to be a change. We know that there's a business model to consult on. We know that we need to take on staff views and stakeholder views to make sure that the right end point is reached. But in staff governance, when I'm representing a senior manager, very often I'll say to somebody who has raised a complaint, has anybody asked you what you want to get out of this? And more often than not, the answer is no. And I'll say, well, what do you want to get out of this? And they'll say, I'd like an apology. I'd like it not to happen again. But I don't want the senior manager to be suspended for 18 months while somebody else does an investigation and I have to bring in all my colleagues through as witnesses. So I think it might be useful because we do have very good staff governance and we do work very well um, together. Um, but I think it would be useful to actually sometimes stop and take stock and then review what we're doing and then say, is it time to evolve what we're doing? Are there other things that we can put to one side? And how do we reintroduce certain skills that are lost, such as talking to one another, rather than putting in a, a grievance, for example, when we feel a bit ticked off with one of our managers? I know certainly, and I'm sure other um, colleagues will, will have this, where we have constituents who come to us um, who work in the health service and they have a particular issue and um, they often come to us because they can't work through the system that's there and there appears to I mean my perception is that there there is an arrangement or a deal struck or a you know whatever at, at the level of the tripartite arrangement that they are completely unaware of the person on the ground floor is completely unaware of and they'll come back and say well who agreed this who told us about this so they then come to their MSP for representation because they maybe go through their staff, you know, their, it could be their union, it could be whoever, um, to try and get a solution to that. And they are unaware that somebody up there has agreed a, a course of action. That's where we find that in our constituency case, where I certainly do, and I'm sure others have as well. Matt, sorry, yes. Hey, hey, convener, just to pick up uh, that point, I, th I think you've hit on a a fairly significant challenge in the partnership arrangements. And I just I smiled when you mentioned it because I think I do remember a, a, a long discussion with a colleague eh, on your right when she was a Unison shop steward about getting sucked into, bearing in mind these are volunteers part-time doing a, a professional eh, a job as well, but getting sucked into the machinery of meetings. And I think all of the members here, I'm sure, will appreciate that meetings can become the, their own uh, uh, industry. Um, and, and it can be very difficult in those circumstances when you've got, you know, political uh, direction, when you've got chief official direction, when you've got chief officers uh, locally, when you've got uh, local managers locally saying to you, we need to make that change, we need to make that change, we need to make that change, to then make the space in place for the shop steward to go and have what we might have called a shop meeting uh, in the old days, to go out into a workplace and just have a chat uh, with colleagues. And so there's a lot more done now, I think, electronically and in bulletins and flyers and, again, in your own uh, professions, you'll know that you can uh, write to people uh, to your hands fall off if they don't read it or don't comprehend what you're writing to them because they're maybe busy with real lives, uh, then that can be uh, a major a major challenge. The other thing I would say, though, that, that, that and I, th I think we need to recognise that there is a need for a space to be made for that and commitment to be made for that when we do uh, localised uh, change agendas. I think there's a couple of things that just challenge that a wee bit, and, and we're seeing a bit more of it. Um, Staff governance doesn't mean we can disagree. And again, I, I, I look to the colleague in your right because I, I can recall the conversations we had when, when uh, Claire was a shop steward. You can go into that arrangement and say, I'm sorry, we don't agree with that. 
and then work through a mechanism to try to get to agreement, if that's the case. But people still have uh, natural, traditional, industrial uh, methodologies available to them, uh, if we can get that, that consensus. Um, but look at the number of employees, if, if we strip out equal pay, look at the number of employment tribunals that are lodged against the NHS employers in Scotland. They, they will compare very, very favourably, favourably with every other industry, including local government and the voluntary sector, private sector in the country. There's a reason for that. It's because there is at least a point in time where we, albeit that the machinery moves at a pace that you wouldn't recognise as progress sometimes, but there is always that opportunity to get through that staff governance route, through that partnership route to solutions and problems. And, and we, I think, collectively use that with the employers and, and with colleagues in government to our, to our maximum a, a benefit. So that's a key measure, I think, of, of where we are in the staff governance route. Yeah? Marie. I wonder if I could ask specifically about the, um, how easy it is to raise concerns or to whistleblow if you've got concerns about a colleague's practice. So um, I guess I need to remind everyone that I worked for 20 years as a clinical pharmacist in a psychiatric hospital. So in the 20 years that I worked from the mid-90s till recently, um, there was a transformational change was my perception and how easy it was to raise concerns about other people's practice um, or about practices that you witnessed in the hospital. Would the panel say that that uh, reflects a national trend, or is that simply my own experience? The head vigorously there. Yeah, I am shaking because I actually went back. We have link members. We don't have reps. We have link members, so I have people I can just directly contact and say, "Could you answer this question for me?" So I have some evidence here from senior managers who say they have never seen somebody raise concerns through whistleblowing and not had a particularly devastating impact on them personally, whether it's them on their career, whether it's them and their relationships with their colleagues. But we, whistleblowing is a, is a very vital part of you know, the staff governance and, and how, we, how we safeguard you know, our interactions. But I think that from what our members say, the senior managers, they think it's still a very blame-orientated um, attachment to you that you have had the temerity, how dare you, raise you know, concerns through whistleblowing. There are other routes to use. You know, it's an undignified way of doing it. But we need whistleblowing and we need people to feel safe in whistleblowing. And I don't think that they do. In, in the uh, medical field, um, raising concerns about a colleague is both a very professional and a very personal issue. Um, for a doctor, your personal, repu your professional reputation is, is, is all, and a slight to that is, is, is a real wound uh, and, and felt, and, and people tend to react against that. And I think what is often seen is, is, is uh, a very toxic reaction when, when, when um, people's practice is, is, is uh, held up to question. Uh, and of course, in the, um, in the medical field, it's not so much raise, necessarily raising concerns as you would understand it in terms of whistleblowing. It might be more a case of referring that person to the GMC, uh, for the GMC to take uh, appropriate action. And then you get into a kind of tit for tat thing of, well, how can they accuse me? They're, they're not exactly blameworthy themselves and all, and all the rest of it, you know? So, so, so there, there, there is that. Um, but I, I don't know whether this is the time to mention it. I think you, you said, convener, that you were going to look at raising concerns in, in, in more depth. No, no, uh, carry on. Generally. Um, but I, I think medical professionals and all the clinical professionals um, in their day-to-day -day practice in, in the health service see things which they're not comfortable with and they want to raise con concerns. It's always a, uh, a, a tricky issue. If it's about your employer, you have, you have protections at law. Um, but even then, um, 
we've, we've seen, and you, you'll, have, you'll have read in the testimony of various individuals, that sometimes those protections don't really amount to much, and relationships are destroyed, careers are destroyed, and, and, and all the rest of it. And that's with those protections in place. As I was starting to say earlier, junior doctors are in the unique position uh, in that they have a power relationship with NHS Education for Scotland who control uh, access to and retention on their training programme. And if the relationship with uh, NES goes wrong uh, and they fall out of their training programme, de facto, they've lost their, their job and their, and their career as well, and they have no protection. Uh, against the uh, against the actions of NES. That's not to say NES are a bad organisation. Clearly, they're not. They're a very good and important organisation. Uh, but these things uh, do happen um, from time to time and place um, and place to place. And recently, in uh, in in England, arrangements have been put in place with Health Education England to provide those same protections within the training relationship for trainee doctors there. Uh, but so far, NES have been not been willing to uh, pursue similar arrangements here. So junior doctors are still even more probably reticent to raise concerns if it's going to put their training relationship in jeopardy. Ros? Yeah, I, th I think there's a big difference between raising concerns and whistleblowing. Um, um, we, we have our members come to us on a daily basis raising concerns normally about staffing levels. Um, but whistleblowing, I think it's very early days with the legislation to see how it's going to work. I was at Lothian Area Partnership Forum yesterday and they actually gave a report back to us on the whistleblowing. And there was, they've had nine cases of, of, that have gone through the whistleblowing policy since September last year, which they've investigated. A number of those are anonymous, so it's very difficult to be able to feed back and to get some further information. But I would say that people are now very much aware of the whistleblowing legislation and they know about the policies. There's been a lot of work done, certainly in the health boards that I cover with regard to that. However, I think it's always difficult to raise a concern. It's very hard to put your head above the parapet. But like the BMA, um, you know, a lot of our members are a regulated profession, as, as well as the, our AHP colleagues. So they are bound by their own code of conduct, so that if they do see it, anything that is putting patient care at risk, then they absolutely have an obligation to do that. And we always support and encourage our members to do that, because you know, we are about patient safety and quality. Yeah, just, just to add, yes, of course, that uh, regulations will ensure, I mean, uh, clinicians have a duty of care and they will have to look to their um, uh, code of conduct and to their duty of care if they have serious concerns. <laughs> I think the difficulty is, as we've said, whistleblowing is about revealing something that has perhaps been hidden, whereas sometimes um, the concerns are whether or not the quality of service is suffering, but at what point does that become whistleblowing, at what point does that become unsafe, isn't always clear. We will clearly um, uh, uh, be, well, our professional, the various professional bodies of the Allied Health <coughs> Professions will be there to, to support <coughs> and advise members in those circumstances. But of course, these pertain to particular circumstances. And uh, I'm not always sure that the, the, the notion of whistleblowing is, is often seen as uh, for the, the headline scandal aspect of things, rather than a, a run of the mill way in which you can raise concerns where the quality of services is being diminished. Hey, Matt? Yeah, I think just, just briefly, Convener, I, I, I appreciate you'll be busy. I mean, I, I think um, whistleblowing uh, is, is an emerging issue. I mean, our, our position is quite clear. We think the NHS has the machinery uh, to deal with whistleblowing. The DTEX system that, that exists across the NHS in Scotland, I think, is a very good principled system. What people don't get is they don't get feedback from that when they make a, a, a referral or a report at a local level if there's something they're not quite happy about. Colleagues have spoke about the need for professionals to reflect, and that's absolutely key as well. I do think at a kind of senior level, the NHS can be quite defensive and risk-averse. Um, I think there's a kind of hierarchical, macho uh, culture exists in some places. Um, I have to say, almost right from the top. Uh, and I think that quashes any, any ability for the service itself to properly reflect and deal with genuine concerns in a sensitive and sensible way. And so, therefore, we get into conflict, we get into positions, uh, and that, that, that doesn't help. So, 
Um, but, but I do think it, it, we have to say that the, the machinery is there. It's about how it's, it's about people investing in that. I think uh, some of us who were here when the um, Lothian waiting time scandal emerged them um, see exactly that culture uh, or saw exactly that culture. Uh, Claire, very briefly, because we'll, 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 we need to move on. Well, could just I just say we haven't got a lot of time this morning, so could people mm -hmm. keep their answers pretty snappy? I, I just would like to draw the committee's attention to the fact that um, employees in the NHS are aware of the fact that since the Francis report, they do have a, they do have a duty of candour to um, raise concerns, which don't always lead to whistleblowing, as, as we've pointed out. There's a two different, and it's how to balance that in a very risk-averse, often, system. Marie, sorry. So I, I wanted to ask about one specific situation which is raised with me frequently when I'm out meeting folk who work in the health service, and that's the, the um, issues around the quality provided by locum and temporary staff. Um, so there is probably a much better um, system in place for um, managing people who are employed within the NHS service. Do you think that the system is robust enough for people who are not um, permanently employed but working in the NHS? Um, do you like to answer that? It, it, it can be in the interest of keeping it snappy. Any organisation or system that relies on bank or temporary workers is going to have difficulty driving staff governance and quality. And, and we have a lot of areas where we're relying wholly on, on you know, bank workers or temporary workers. Absolutely delighted to work with you to resolve that. OK. Alex? Vina, good morning to the panel. I'm very glad Marie raised the issue of raising concerns, and I'm quite sure that the <coughs> environment for raising concerns, as she described her experience as a, a, a cl clinical pharmacist, um, ha has transformed because there are far more concerns to raise, um, not least in terms of workforce planning, in terms of delays, blockage in the particularly social care end of the spectrum, which leads to an interruption in flow across the NHS. Um, but I think these are two very different things, and we brought this up. So whilst it's OK for um, staff to raise concerns at the macro level, and we see that, and I get doctors in my surgery all the time raising concerns about the macro level, whistleblowing is an intensely personal thing. And we've seen from staff surveys across the workforce that they have no faith in current whistleblowing uh, structures, so that they, they're not, first of all, convinced they'll be believed, that action will follow as a result of it, and that there will be no recrimination as a result of that. And just wonder, I know we don't have a lot of time, convener, but how do we stop that? How do we change that? Because clearly, you know, if there's bad practice in the NHS, we need to root it out. If there are individuals responsible at any level, any tier for bad practice, then we need to address it. But if there is no belief in the system, we can never do that. Ross. What we need to do is it's wider than staff governance. What we need to do is make sure that the culture set by those up top is supportive and enabling. And unless we've got that throughout the health service, then staff are not going to feel confident that they're going to be supported if they do raise a legitimate concern. Clear? I, I think we have to be able to enable people to understand that there will be no blame. I think we have to really bring forward the fact that you do have a duty of candour, but also you have to be mindful of emotional intelligence and say, well, how do I bring this forward? Because uh, many of the senior managers have a clinical or former clinical background or a professional background, and they are aware of having, you know, that particular part of their identity. It would have been a, seen as a slight, as, as you have mentioned before. So we have to re reset how we talk to one another in the NHS. We don't accuse one another of doing things. We don't blame one another. And we certainly don't blame people for bringing concerns or for raising whistleblowing, because things usually only get to a whistleblowing level when people who have tried to raise concerns haven't been listened to. So it is about resetting from the top down, and that's from the political impact all the way through to everybody who has any interaction with the NHS. How do we work together and take national pride in working together, and how do we put blame to one side and seek understanding? And that's the way forward in, in our, our eyes. Yes, Donald. Uh, <coughs> thanks, Convener. Um, we put great store in the, uh, within the governance arrangements on a constructive approach to resolving uh, concerns raised and, and working within uh, teams in, in, in boards. But as has been expressed, 
over very over very many years, and it's, it's also seen in the in the uh, the last staff survey that that, that there is a, a, a significant degree of lack of trust that concerns will be uh, acted upon. You can't just wave a wand and make people trust in arrangements when they perceive that, um, that there's a vested interest in bad news stories uh, being exposed or, or getting out and reflecting badly on the organisation. And while I think that um, it, it, it's a responsibility on all of us to do all we can to support the existing constructive internal arrangements, um, ultimately there needs to be some sort of impartial appeal arrangement uh, that, that, could, that can oversee that. I think it was, it was always, I think, a, a cons um, likely, I think, that people would see the, the flaw in the, in the help plan that refers people always back to the internal arrangements and there's no escape from the inward-looking uh, way of, 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 of addressing things. And there has to be a degree of proportion, proportionality about that so people aren't always escalating and escalating and escalating and, and, and um, you know, is, is it right and proper that there should be a, a, an appeal? There needs to be a mechanism to, 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 to judge that as to when it's safe to leave it where it is and, where it's, and when it's appropriate to, to have somebody impartial uh, cast, a second, cast a second eye on this and sort of say, well, that, that's not really best practice. OK, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Alison. Um, thank you. Um, probably following on from that, um, you know, you spoke about uh, perhaps the need to have an impartial appeal arrangement, and you're probably aware that there's a current petition um, in Parliament for the establishment of a new national whistleblower hotline. And uh, do you think that an independent organisation would be beneficial? I see Matt shaking his head. Kevin, I think our evidence in that matter is, is, is fairly well established. Um, and we, we don't support the view uh, that you, you should give money to the private sector to develop a a, 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 a hotline, a call centre on these issues. You know, there are problems. The, the governance exists. I think the notion that we might have some kind of whistleblowing ombudsman um, is is much uh, more sensible and constructive. Um, because I think that would then deal with the uh, appeals uh, issues. You know, we've seen the ombudsman approach work in other in other sectors, and I think that would work better here than just handing money to a call centre somewhere. Is that a view shared by the panel? I'm not sure what evidence there is that a, the availability of a hotline would mean that people would have a motive to call it necessarily. I'm not sure. I wonder what circumstances that would happen. Okay. Can I ask another question, Convener, and probably directed to Ross Shaw and Matt McLaughlin again? Um, the Royal College of Nursing, you, you highlighted in your submission that integration authorities don't operate at the same partnership model as between the NHS, the government and the unions. And, and Unison, you noted too that integration means, and I'm quoting now, that health services and workers find themselves managed on a daily and strategic basis by non-health professionals. Um, as a result, there's a need to ensure that there is no dilution of the standards for affected NHS workers. I just wondered if you could expand on how staff governance has been affected by integration. Um, I think it's early days yet, um, in that the structures are just in, uh, beginning to get set up now and being developed. Um, in the integration authorities, our, our members from the NHS are still employed by the NHS. So they will always have, whilst they will have a manager potentially that's from the council where they have a very different um, culture of working with the trade unions, um, I think it would be fair to say that our members would always be able to go back through their professional structures because they've got professional accountability to the NHS. However, it's something that we are keeping a very close eye on because we have got concerns that the, the same partnership arrangements are not going to be in place there for our, our members. Okay, thank you. I mean, just put, sorry, convener, three, three quick points. I, I think there is just the significant potential for confusion when one person understands and knows and is steeped in one culture and one set of rules of engagement 
uh, and they are managing a group of people who have a different culture, rules of engagement and stuff. Let me give you two very, very quick examples. Um, in, in recent uh, months, um, the IGIB leads in the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde area have decided that it would be a good idea to slash the school nursing budget by over 50 per cent, with no reference to the staff side, even, even at a, a, a high level, uh, let alone uh, at a local uh, level. Um, and, and that runs contrary to the work that we're doing with Scottish Government and a whole host of, of areas uh, in terms of, of getting it right for every uh, child. So there's a major issue there in terms of the big staff governance picture. And that's a rear guard action we're having to uh, work our way through at the minute. But even in a very local level, um, last week I met with a group of workers uh, who had been transferred from Parkhead Hospital to Stob Hill Hospital with a very clear set of shift patterns, very clear contractual entitlements. And, and you know, a colleague from another uh, organisation who sits above them in the, in the, in the hierarchy uh, structure decided that they would just be issued a 90-day notice of change for their hours of work and their place of work and their working arrangements. And that's just not how we do things in the NHS. Now, what that does is it generates hours of work for poor old me over a long weekend uh, when people are quite, quite, quite rightly upset. So we're not getting it right at that level. And I think IGIBs, because of their nature and their construct, have the potential for those cultures to clash a wee bit. And we could do, actually, we could do a bit of guidance for government uh, uh, and the department on, on how that works. I agree with what Matt and what Ros are saying. What we find with managers in partnership is that some of our members are line managed. You know, they're experts, they're expert managers in health. They have MSCs, they have PhDs, um, they, they've worked into this particular role, into this particular profession because they have knowledge and credibility and the ability to do very, very difficult jobs. And then they're line managed by somebody from local authority who doesn't understand that particular part of what they do. And they think, well, actually, how can I save that money? Can I, can I maybe do some reorganisational change? Could I look at spending your money in a different way? Um, or actually, if one of our managers, um, our members, goes to talk to their um, non-NHS manager and explain what the risk is, then it's, it's not seen as being credible, it's not understood. And the correct steps that we've all spent a lot of time establishing the framework of governance to help us all have a core point of understanding that we all go to and say, that's our starting point, this is what we follow. Then we find that that's then put to one side and we end up with a bit of a mess that a lot of people have to then spend a lot of time sorting out. Very frustrating. That would, and presumably that's a two-way arrangement. Um, I should imagine that if you have somebody from local authority, they would yeah. say the same thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Um, uh, Donald, did you want to come in? Yeah, just very briefly. Uh, well, I have... Well, we, su we support the idea, again, behind uh, integration. We, we do have um, a number of concerns about how it's applied, but in terms of um, employee in involvement and engagement for medical staff, it's just not happening. It's barely happening at all for, for primary care staff, for GPs, and not, and not happening at all for secondary care doctors. Now, it will be said that, oh, we speak to medical directors, uh, and, and, and people at that level, but they're not talking to operational doctors who deliver the services. Um, so in terms of, of, of planning services and doing what integration is meant to do, which, it was to, which is to link things up and join things up and, and, and have, have smooth systems across health and social care, they're not involving uh, the doctors who are doing the delivery. Um, and so potentially they're setting themselves up to fail at an early stage. Ross? And just to come back on that, um, we lobbied in 2014 to ensure that there was a nurse board member on every integration authority and recently we've done a bit of work looking at some of the decisions that are being made with regard to community nursing and unfortunately some of these decisions are actually being made without the involvement of the, the nurse member on the board which is extremely concerning for us. The government vision, you know, the 2020 vision is all about transferring care into the community and ensuring that we've got the right numbers of, of nurses and other healthcare professionals out there. And we've got massive vacancies in the community at the moment, particularly with di within district nursing, and as Matt said, in school nursing. And that example that he used was one that we're aware of as well. There's also another example where um, senior managers have been stripped out who are the clinical decision making. Again, I believe that's in the Glasgow area as well, um, where the, the, the band kind of 80 senior managers have kind of 
and just been stripped out. And that is where the nurses on the front line, your um, healthcare support workers, your community staff nurses, your district nurses and health visitors would go for some professional support and look, look, look for advice. And that has been stripped out in Glasgow and um, without a great deal of consultation. Kenrick? Uh, and I would add, um, we, of course, did not get uh, a, a legislative sp uh, specification for an allied health profession on the IJBs. And, of course, an allied health profession uh, representative is themselves representing 12 professions. Um, and those professions have the kind of expertise and knowledge in specific things that are not going to be well understood. And even that has to be coordinated by the, the, the AHP representing all of them to cut that out from... IJB decision making can lead to significant gaps in going forward or, or just uh, less good decision making, sometimes bad decision making, simply from that lack of understanding about the, the, the contribution of the service being provided. Clear. Thanks, uh, convener. And just, I just want to pick up on a, on a point that you made yourself, uh, Donald Harley, um, about uh, doctors' voices not being heard at the at IJB board level. Yeah. Um, does the BMA feed into the staff side representation that sits on the IJBs? Uh, and are you talking specifically from a from a, a trade union point of view? Or are you talking about a, a professional point of view? Well, uh, both essentially, just the risk of repeating myself. What we had hoped to see from it is that people who are involved in clinical decision-making at a local level would be engaged by the IJBs. And what I'm saying is that our members say that isn't happening. So why is that not happening? Should that, if it's professionally, should it not be fed through the medical director? And if it's from a trade union point of view, should that be not fed through the, to the staff side representative sitting on the IJB? Um, well, we don't... Well, I think it's more complicated than that, to, to, to be honest. Well, I, I, I don't understand the, you know, the, the point that you're making then. Yeah. So... Well, I'm not sure we have time today to go through the detail of... Our, Maybe you could follow up the detail yeah, and, yeah. Absolutely. Write, and write yeah. to the yeah. committee and, yeah. and, and, and follow that up. Mm -hmm. OK. Is that OK, Yeah, that would yeah. be fine. Um, and we've had um, sessions with um, frontline staff. We've had sessions with middle managers in the NHS. And um, the themes that came across there was a, a system that's under massive pressure where people are um, feeling the, the heat from their manager and the managers above them uh, and ultimately from presumably government in this place where targets are demanded and you know budgets are well we've already had a debate about budgets this morning but budgets are under huge pressure um, and that that seems to be creating a culture within the system where people are um, afraid, intimidated, feel unable to raise concerns and uh, frustrated at, at where they go when, where there are concerns. Um, is, that, is that a reflection on the, the system that you're working in at the moment or is that an exaggeration? Matt. I think um, NHS workers are no different from any other. I suppose what I'm asking Matt, is it, are the pressures now more than they've ever been? Yeah. I think the pressures are. I think the pressures are being more keenly felt than they've ever been, and I, th I think some of the issues that you've heard about staffing levels and some of the issues we've heard about culture, uh, and some of the issues we've heard about people just having to do more for less. A, a feed into that, particularly in an ageing workforce, particularly in an ageing community where the demands on people become a, more. But I also think that, that that can sometimes be a bit overstated as well. Um, um, I do think a, people globally need to take some responsibility for their own a, lives. I think, you know, everybody should be a political activist, in my view, or a trade union activist, in my view, you know, and I think, I think people can do... I certainly work with our trade union colleagues more positively 
uh, and rather be passive trade union members, I'd encourage them, if they're unhappy, to be active trade union members, because that's how we get the message through to your good selves uh, and, and others. So, um, but, but it's tough, it's hard, and uh, uh, people are feeling it, yeah? Hey, Ross. Um, I would agree. It, I think it is tougher than it's ever been. I think the pressures that, um, with the budgets are immense. I think it would be remiss not to mention the fact that um, healthcare professionals and nursing staff have had a loss of earnings, which has severely impacted on uh, the numbers within the wards. We've got members coming to us who are saying that they're demoralised, they're, they're lacking in motivation because they've had this 9 to 14% pay cut in real terms. That is significant, um, and it's the same across the whole public sector. This is coupled with um, absolutely massive workloads, which leads to stress and fatigue. People are taking on extra hours, bank work, agency work, in order to make ends meet. So I think all that means that you've got your head down, that you're working, and it's hard to engage. You know, I agree with Matt. It'd be great if all our members were active members, but actually, when you're exhausted and you're doing extra hours and you're, you know, you're having to rely on your unsocial hour payments to make ends meet, it's really tough out there. So I think it's a really difficult situation at the moment. And I think the reality is for many frontline staff members, they just don't feel empowered <coughs> to be able to change the fact that services are being, you know, you know, they're, they're just told this is the situation and we're going to have to suck it up. Clear? Okay, I've got a couple of points. I would, well, a few points I'd like to make. I, mean, I do agree with um, um, my colleagues, and I especially agree with what Matt has said about people needing to take more responsibility, because very often, if, if people raise concerns to me or if I go to represent one of our members, people will say, such and such a person made me try to feel like this. And we'll say, well, what makes you think that person wanted you to feel as bad as that? Can we actually have a sensible conversation about what happened? Do we have to go down a grievance or a complaint where you know, you're bringing in witnesses and everybody are being upset? Because that adds to pressure. And there is a lot of pressure in the system at the moment. And you... Ros is referring to members who have to use unsocial hours payments to make up their pay. Our members don't have that, but they're absorbing more and more stress. When I engage with our members, I had a conversation with them um, recently. I was, I was saying, what do you want me to do for you? And they had said, just protect our own time because we are exhausted. There's been so many stripping out of middle management roles that actually that brings the, the interface between more senior managers and more junior managers right, right as, to, as a, a rock in a hard place. And there's no give, there's no support. There's a lot of blame though. Um, and people don't feel they can say no. So we have members who are in their work, place of work, you know, before seven o'clock. They will leave after 10 o'clock. They will do three hours, four hours on a Saturday and on a Sunday to the detriment of their family lives. And that's to the detriment of their health and their mental health. And they are giving more and more, and yet they're getting more and more blame. And, you know, we talk about frontline services, but a lot of our members, you can't actually see them and they feel that they're not valued. So if you think about when you open a new hospital or a new clinic and you have a politician standing with people in uniform and you know, the person who manages the laundries, the person who manages the catering, the person who project managed the new build and kept it within budget is nowhere to be seen because they're persona non grata, because they don't wear a uniform. So we do have a direct discrimination system as well where people don't feel valued. And then if we can come back to rumours, there's loads of rumours, and they start from the top down, and I mean beyond the NHS, they start in various other think tanks or other places. So I got an email from one of our members on Friday, and I think this will be relevant to one of the points that Alex was making when we came into the room at the very beginning. He sent, I got an email from one of our members saying, can you please tell me that the rumours are not true, that all the alcohol and drug partnerships are being binned? because it's my job, it's my service that I, that I um, deliver in integration with local authority, but that is an entire team at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon thinking that they're not going to be having any, they won't have any job in about three or four months' time. But also think about the member, sorry, the, the people who receive the support from that particular group and what their weekend is going to be like when they have no access to support <coughs> and the rumours. So I think, yes, there's greater pressure. Less, yes, there's less money. People are in a pressured system and they need to be able to think, 
why do I think, why do I think somebody's trying to upset me or what are my perceptions? How can I reality check them? Who's part of the team? Because there's always people who are feeling left out of the team, such as a non-uniform wearing staff. And we need to cut down on gossip and rumours because they're profoundly unhealthy. OK, Claire. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, can I just briefly um, mention something that you put in, in, in your submission uh, there, uh, Claire Puller? OK. Um, about, uh, I'm looking at section H here uh, on page two, where you say there's a widespread belief that NHS will crumble without the ongoing contribution of its international staff. As one member told us, the anti-immigrant culture in the UK at the moment is hugely embarrassing and personally hurtful. Um, I wonder if you could maybe, um, if maybe if the panel could uh, comment on the pressures that perhaps the current situation in the UK and, and Brexit are, are causing to our NHS staff. Yeah. You want me to say something? So I should imagine we all have something to say, um, but particularly um, it, it is unpleasant, but there is, there is a spike in um, people seeking support because they feel decisions are being made against them because they're not being seen as part of the the team of, of the workforce that's going to be moving forward. It's naturally assumed you're not going to be here. Um, and actually, why are you still here? Because you should see the writing on the wall, you're not wanted. Although we want you because we want you to work here. If you're British, that would be fine. So that's some of the attitude um, that is permeating at the moment um, and some of the newer casework that's presenting for me. If anybody else wants to comment very briefly, we've not got a lot of time left. Um, in, certainly in, in physiotherapy, we know that we have had international students who have who've, who've studied through the Scottish system and have qualified as physiotherapists and are working in the NHS, but um, they have two years following, I, I believe, following uh, graduation they, that they can work in the NHS, and then they have to be earning over a certain threshold, or they are told that they can no longer work. And that threshold at the moment, I think it's about 35,000, it means that uh, a band six physiotherapist does not qualify, and we've got a few situations at the moment where they've been looking at ways in which they can keep on to those staff members and they simply can't because uh, the rules are saying that that's not possible and this is at a time when you know we're having trouble filling vacancies in many areas and it's often the rural areas and the small teams where this can have the biggest impact so we have those concerns and we have voiced our concerns about the the current arrangements uh, for uh, uh, overseas um, uh, for, for non-EU and in this case, I think it was Canadian, uh, uh, Canadian born. Um, where that leaves us in the EU in future is a large question mark. But the impact, if it were to be applied to the EU workers in the NHS, would be significant. Donald? Yeah, just very briefly, and, and you may already, already know this, um, there's, there's a not insignificant proportion of doctors are EU graduates. Um, Scotland already struggles to recruit and retain doctor, enough doctors overall to, to meet the operational commitments that we, uh, we, we set. Um, in the worst case scenario, if, if we were to lose EU graduates, uh, we'd see another f significant hole in the medical cover we provide in, in, in Scotland. Now, obviously we all hope that that isn't going to happen, but there's no certainty about that, and we already see and hear many anecdotes of people making arrangements to look for employment elsewhere in the EU uh, rather than take a chance uh, that something may, adverse may happen if there isn't an appropriate settlement. Rose? I would agree we can't afford to lose our EU nursing staff either. I think we've got a, a significant amount of vacancies at the moment. At the end of December last year, we had 1,800 hospital vacancies and over 600 community nursing vacancies. So that's just in the NHS. I appreciate this is about the NHS, but the, the situation is even worse in the independent sector who've got a heavy reliance on EU nationals. Uh, Matt? I think just briefly, Chair, um, um, a constant uh, constitutional confusion doesn't help uh, anyone, uh, and particularly people who, who um, need a bit of... Uh, confidence uh, that coming here to work means that they can come here and they can stay here and invest uh, in their futures. And I think it's beyond professional grades as well. You know, there are many, many areas where the support staff uh, are quite heavily made up uh, of, of, of e EU uh, uh, colleagues and, and, and colleagues from slightly further afield. So um, yeah, it would be really helpful if we could get beyond the constitutional spin and get into actually some delivery of service. So stuff like workforce planning will help. 
And can I, uh, thank you, Convener. Can I just ask briefly about I Matters, um, which has been uh, has replaced the the uh, staff. A survey, the annual staff survey, and just uh, briefly to ask for the, the panel's comments on iMatters and how effective they think that that is, what their experience has been of it. Very briefly. Dead briefly. If people act on what they're told, it'll be a raging success. If people do what they did with the existing staff survey, which was completely ignore it, it'll just be the same again. Ross? I think it's got the potential to be really helpful because it drills down into team level. So provided, as Matt says, people get the opportunity and the space to, to work within their team to get an action plan in place, I think it could have a lot of potential influence. Donald? Uh, as Ross said, there's, there, there's a real gain in terms of uh, employee engagement at, at team departments and, uh, and, and, and board level in terms of driving local solutions. Um, I suppose the slight concern is it doesn't cover all the areas that the old staff survey did. Uh, as I understand it, the plan is that there will be uh, flash surveys to cover those areas, and these are particularly things around the, the issues of uh, how, how people see that um, uh, grievances are dealt with, or discrimination, or raising concerns and things like that. So um, yeah, I think it's important to... to, to that we see that, that, that those flash surveys do take place. There is that there is no uh, gap in in what we're asking the workforce. Um, but but uh, but overall, a lot of work needs to be done to get more people to engage with it. I think my 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 rough um, calculations show show that only 25% of doctors, for example, uh, completed the the survey. Um, that, that that's relatively um, low. Um, and, and that might reflect a, a, a degree of cynicism about, about how valuable the process is if you see the same figures year after year and action isn't generating significant improvements in areas of concern then um, uh, that that's becomes a harder sell for people to take part in it I guess Clear. I think um, our, our members think that iMatters is um, useful but you must be allowed to ring fence time for it otherwise it's just more paperwork for people and just actually you don't matter it's the paperwork that matters so we need to think why are we asking people to do this why are we saying it matters why is it important and yes you must have time to be able to prioritize this you are allowed to prioritize it okay could I ask a very final point to Donald it's a very specific point and junior doctor hours um, a, a few years ago we saw the tragic death of doctor Lauren Conley um, following an extended period of um, long shifts, consecutive long shifts, and there were supposed to be changes uh, occurred after that in relation to rotas for junior doctors and the like. Um, you've raised issues around the protection of junior doctors um, who for whistleblowing, and it could be that people would want to raise issues such as those extended long periods that leave people extremely tired, some people who have to travel distances to their work, and, and we saw the tragic consequences in that case. Um, has that changed? Is the position better for junior doctors in terms of um, not just officially the rota that they work, but actually what they work? Uh, not, the, not their rota hours, but the actual hours that they work. And um, if, we do, if they don't have the same protection uh, as they do in England, uh, what type of um, negotiations are you in with the Scottish Government to advance that so that they do have protection, particularly on issues where, you know, in many ways this is, this is life and death issues? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a complicated um, issue. An action has been taken by Scottish Government to address the concerns raised by both us and um, Dr Conley's uh, uh, father, for, for, for example. But um, I, I think because of, of the obviously tragic circumstances of, of that, the, 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 there's been quite a degree of emotion around it and, and, and sensitivity and, and, um, and the things that are done are not necessarily the things that will have the best impact on junior doctors' quality of life. So the number of days back-to-back uh, -back is one area that's been uh, um, tackled, but you, you have to look at the whole arrangement for how juniors are, are employed. So, for example, you could 
uh, limit those number of days, but it might mean you only get one weekend away in a month because uh, you, end, you end up covering alternate weekends in, the, in a complex shift pattern. So actually your quality of life and your family connections are deteriorated. So um, ultimately, when, you, when you're looking to improve the arrangements, the, there's got to be some flexing of, 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 of all these things. And uh, I think in the aftermath of the, of the Connolly tragedy, um, the, 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 uh, the, 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 there was a rush to do something uh, rather than take a holistic approach to, to um, what, what is a very constrained solution. So, so uh, we, we would encourage the um, Scottish Government to have more and further dialogue with the Scottish Junior Doctors Committee. So uh, I suppose what I'm asking is, is the system better, the same or worse? Uh, better, but more to do. And in terms of the legal protection, uh, the legal protection that's um, missing in your submission. Mm -hmm. uh, are there negotiations going on in that in terms of legal protection for whistleblowers in Scotland? Uh, my, my understanding is, is that uh, uh, NES were not receptive to that suggestion. Okay. Could I thank the panel very much for their um, evidence this morning and suspend briefly till we allow the panel to leave. Thanks. Uh, agenda item three is subordinate legislation with two negative instruments to consider. Uh, both these instruments were considered last week and the committee agreed to defer consideration so a letter could be issued to the Scottish Government seeking clarification on the reason and impact for the delay in operating uh, for the assessment of resources and the sums for personal requirements. We have now uh, uh, received a response from the Scottish Government. Uh, the first instrument is the National Assistance Assessment of Resources Amendment Scotland Regulations 2017. There has been no motion to annul and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Can I invite any comments from members? No. I, I think the one issue I would say is that in the letter we're not clear as to what the uh, impact of the delay in implementing uh, the regulations will have on individuals, the financial implications. So I think it would uh, be appropriate for us to ask that when the Cabinet Secretary comes before us to try and find that out. Um, any other comments that people have? Well, I appreciate that, Convener. And also just to ask, uh, I mean, understand that the delay was because of ongoing discussions with COSLA. Um, 
I'd also be interested to know, you know, the date on which Cosla wrote to all the local authorities. But perhaps we can air these issues with the cabinet secretary. Yeah, I think I think we most certainly should. Yes. Okay. Um, the second instrument is the. National Assistance Summons for Personal Requirements, Scotland Regulations 2017. Again, there has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Do you have any comments from members? Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, as agreed at a previous meeting, we will now move into private session. <laughs>